So this is Baruch here. I am at the Tikkun Elevator Caller. We're getting lined up to get on to this magical mystery ride here. That we're going to take us to the book, The Ultimate Connection with God by Rabbi Yosef Chaim Mimra. Seven Step Guide to Jewish Spirituality. Really what this is. And we're going to get into it more and more. This is learning the technique of mystical Jewish meditation. And as you get into it, you'll understand that there's really a lot going on to it. To it. On the last year that we had, we had this concept. He called it the concept of the right brain. And what he wanted to say was, and then I, as he told me personally, because I learned with him a few years, and if he tried to drill in, is this that you have two, two sides to your brain, the left side, which is defensive, basically, and the right side, which is creative. So the question is, is that what we need to be able to do is open up the concept of the right side. Because the right side is the side that's able to be able to see beyond the country, the constrictions of life. So he wrote there, all true artists, now artists could also refer to Kabbalists, whether they are aware of it or not, mind their genius from a realm beyond their thinking mind. The thinking mind is the left part of the brain. Creative mind is the right part of the brain. Let's come over here and let's see the next one that Rabbi Mimram is bringing us. This is a quote from Mishila Yisharim. So it says like this, that of course, for those who don't know, it's Rabbi, but Rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Dusata. There should be, the call, also called the Ramcha. He, the Ramcha writes, there should be no greater goal, goal in a person's life, whether small or big, than that of coming close to his creator. One should break all obstacles between yourself and your maker, which are all the material matters and other related objectives, until he is pulled after his creator as a metal bar is pulled to a magnet. Ramchal. Rabbi Memra. When it happens that a gap occurs in our stream of thought, when we land into a state of no mind, it is possible to experience moments of deep peace. For most people, such gaps in thought happen only rarely, and they happen accidentally at times when the mind is rendered speechless. This may occur when one is triggered by great beauty or alternative, alternatively by extreme physical exertion or even by finding oneself in a situation of great danger or great problem. I'd like to add to add that because what we consider to be great problems may not be dangerous, except maybe to our pocketbook or to our relationship. At such times, suddenly there is inner stillness. Surprisingly, within that stillness, there is a subtle but intense joy. There is love. There is peace. Let's see a little bit more. Rabbi Mimram writes, Precious moments like this are generally short-lived, for the mind is quick to resume its usual loud, boisterous activity that we call thinking. So there's a gap in the thinking process that can develop. These feelings of pure love, joy, and peace cannot truly thrive until you have freed yourself of the dominance of your mind. For these feelings are not emotions. They exist on a much deeper level in a place that lies beyond the emotion. The only way to fully experience the pure feelings that lie beyond the emotions is to first become fully conscious of your emotions and to be able to feel them authentically. Now let me just read this last this last line again. He writes the only way to fully experience the pure feelings that lie beyond the emotions is to first become fully conscious of your emotions and to be able to feel them authentically. Now, I'm not sure what he means by that. What he means is that where he's been saying previously, that as we learn to look at our thoughts, we can also learn to look at our emotions. 
And then we understand that the emotions and the thoughts are running together in a certain way, but we can appreciate them in a different way by looking at them. Maybe that's what he means. He says, love, joy, and peace are deep states of the neshama. Or more accurately, they are three beautiful aspects of the state of interconnectedness with the neshama. So, love, joy, and peace. We have a neshama that is within us, is there all the time. The question is, how do we find a way to connect to it? Said because their place is deep inside, where the neshama dwells, because they arise from beyond the mind, they are complete as they are. They have no opposites, no contradictions. So he says, in this way, love, joy, and peace are not at all like emotions, which similar, which which similar to the mind that brings them into existence, of our are of a dualistic nature. Emotions are subject to the laws of opposites. Now this is a basic kind of, this is a Kabbalistic idea of the concept of chesed and gabura. Whereas on the one hand you have constantly gabura going on and that's the left side of the brain. And then you have chesed which is the right side. So this simply means that beyond every emotion lies its opposite. In the world of the mind, there is no good without bad. Thus, when we identify with the mind, we might erroneously think that when we are feeling, what we are feeling is joy. But this type of joy is actually the usually short-lived pleasure that is present within the continuously alternating cycle of pain and pleasure. Now, you have to think about this. Because in Kabbalah, the, the way of saying this would be that the light of the Ain Sofar, as it filters downward, it splits, and it becomes opposites. Then there's also a middle line that can balance the opposites. And underneath this language that we're talking about is an understanding of the line of balance. So understand that the world that we live in, the world of thought, is always in a world of opposites. Opposites means the concept of dinim, or different kinds of pains, or different kinds of, of constrictions that we can't see beyond and that worry us to death. Whereas we have the other opposite possibility, is, is that to move beyond the world of opposites. What is the difference between joy and pleasure, Rabbi Nimrod writes? Pleasure is always derived from something that is outside of you, whereas joy arises from within. So he used two different words. One is the word pleasure. Pleasure is not joy. He says joy comes from an attachment to the neshama. Because pleasure is external, it is almost inevitable that the very thing that gives you pleasure today will give you pain tomorrow. Because, the, as we see in our astrology, that the cycle is also always changing. Or that tomorrow you will not have it, and then its absence will cause you pain. Tomorrow may come immediately, or it may come only after some time, even though you may be in joy for a long time. You got that big contract, you got the money. But now you got to go to work. It might happen, for instance, that you finally acquire something you have been wanting for a long time, but then you realize that it's not as wonderful as you thought it would be when you open up, so to speak, the package. And that realization itself will cause you anguish. The item may break, it may get lost or stolen, or taken care of, or, or something, or it may prove to be more trouble than it's worth. There are countless ways that someone or something that gives you pleasure can later lead to pain or dis disappointment just by taking the pleasure away. He says joy, on the other hand, though, is always there, inside of you. It cannot be lost, stolen, or broken. It will never have a change of heart. It will always be there for you. You need only to learn how to access it. And that's what we're talking about. Not a thing that you get like a pill. This is not a little practice that you could do. This is a devotion. So he writes in his blurb. I love his blurbs. 
feelings of pure love, joy, and peace can only truly thrive until you have freed yourself of the dominance of your mind. This is Borah Fleischman. This has been Rabbi Yosef Chaim Mimran's book, The Ultimate Connection with God.